A man discovered strange boxes buried below Egypt, and their origins are mystifying scientists. It's 1851, and French Egyptologist Auguste Marriott strides up to an imposing tower of boulders, ready to blast them with explosives. He detonates the munitions, and once the dust clears, an extraordinary subterranean labyrinth from more than 3,000 years ago is revealed, and the mysterious giant stone boxes he finds within present a seemingly insoluble puzzle. Marriott had unearthed an ancient burial site known as the Serapeum of Saka. It lies about 15 miles south of Giza. Egypt's best-known pyramid site. The structure of the underground burial chamber is basically that of a tunnel bored into the rock of a mountain. This tunnel acts as a passageway, and positioned off that thoroughfare are a series of chambers or alcoves. Within those chambers lie the huge stone boxes which provide the enigma of the Serapeum. These boxes are hewn from granite. They are truly massive, with the largest of them weighing nearly 90 tons, more than 80 metric tons. Their other extraordinary feature is their almost faultless symmetry. The edges and surfaces of the boxes are carved in painstaking straight lines. When Marriott discovered these enigmatic boxes, sadly all but one of the 25 had previously been looted by grave robbers. That left the question, for what had these monumental boxes been used? It would have taken a great deal of effort to make them. The Egyptians would hardly have gone to all that trouble without a specific purpose in mind. But what was it? We'll get back to these perplexing boxes shortly, but first let's find out a little bit more about Marriott, the French Egyptologist with a penchant for blowing things up. Francois Auguste Ferdinand Marriott was born in 1821 in boulogne sur mer a French seaside town in the north of the country overlooking the English Channel. In 1850, the French government commissioned Marriott to travel to Egypt in search of the best examples of historic manuscripts from the Arabic, Syriac, Coptic, and Ethiopic traditions. Once he found the texts, he was charged with purchasing them. The French wanted them for its museum collections, which were already recognized as the world's foremost. Marriott set out on this, his first journey to Egypt in 1850. But his mission did not meet with success. He simply couldn't track down the sort of manuscripts that he had been told to collect. The truth was that his lack of experience in this type of mission was at the root of his failure. But he couldn't contemplate the shame of returning to France empty-handed. So Marriott now looked around for an alternative prize, some discovery that could earn him respect in his homeland despite his failure to find ancient texts. He became friendly with people from the local Bedouin tribes, and it was those desert Arabs who led him to a fantastic discovery one that would ensure Marriott's enduring fame. The Bedouin led him to a place called Saqqara, which lies to the south of Egypt's modern capital, Cairo. This massive site was once the necropolis, or burial ground for the city, and the one-time capital of ancient Egypt, Memphis. Saqqara is where many of Egypt's best-known buildings from antiquity stand. One such is the famous Pyramid of Djoser, with its distinctive step structure. It dates from some 47 centuries ago. However, when Marriott was guided to the site by the friendly Bedouins, he was less than impressed. All he saw was a bleak desert, landscape punctuated by only sand dunes. But he did spot the head of one sphinx peeking out above the hot desert sand. According to legend, it had been part of a magnificent avenue of 600 such statues. And that spectacular sphinx street had led, it was said, to the Serapeum of Saqqara. At the very least, Marriott believed that it was worth looking for this ancient structure. He began his search not far from the Pyramid of Djoser, tracing the purported Avenue of Sphinxes to what might be the entrance of the Serapeum. In fact, it seems that Marriott had a fairly clear idea of what he was looking for thanks to a Greek historian called Strabo, who lived about 64 BC to 2480. In his book, Le Serapeum de Memphis, published in 1882, Marriott quoted the words of Strabo in which he described what he had seen at the Saqqara Serapeum. Strabo wrote, one finds a temple to Serapis in such a sandy place that the wind heaps up the sand dunes beneath which we saw sphinxes, some half buried, some buried up to the head, from which one can suppose that the way of this temple could not be without danger if one were caught in a sudden windstorm. Commenting on Strabo's text, Marriott wrote, Did it not seem that Strabo had written the sentence to help us rediscover, after almost 18 centuries, the famous temple dedicated to Serapis? It was impossible to doubt it. This buried sphinx, the companion of 15 others I had encountered in Alexandria and Cairo, formed with them, according to the evidence, part of the avenue that led to the Memphis Serapeum. And Marriott continued, 
describing his feelings when he found the site. He wrote, It did not seem to me possible to leave to others the credit and profit of exploring this temple, whose remains of fortunate chance had allowed me to discover and whose location henceforth would be known. Undoubtedly, many precious fragments, many statues, many unknown texts were hidden beneath the sand upon which I stood. But to complete his excavations, Marriott needed a team of workers, so he recruited 30 local men. However, he decided that more than just human labor was needed. Once he'd identified what he believed was the entrance to the Serapeum, he was met by an impenetrable wall of rock. This obstacle could not be removed by hand. So the ingenious Marriott decided that what was needed was a good-sized explosion. Blasting your way into a rare and ancient site would hardly meet the exacting standards of modern archaeology, but this was the mid-19th century, and archaeology in Egypt at the time had something of the Wild West about it. So in 1851, age 30, Marriott stood at the entrance of the Serapeum of Saqqara. On November 12th, he entered the tunnel that had been bored into the mountain, and he came across an incredible treasure trove of ancient bronze tablets, statues, and tombs. Unfortunately, grave robbers had beaten the Frenchman to it, so there was only one undamaged sarcophagus. Although only one stone coffin was undamaged, there was also an almost intact tomb, that of Prince Kamwaset. Born in about 1303 BC, he had reigned as pharaoh from 1279 BC until 1213 BC, when he died at roughly 90. His tomb had actually been revealed under the pile of rock that had been blown up with the explosives. Fortunately, Kamwaset's sarcophagus had survived the blast undamaged. Inside the coffin were the mummified remains of Kame Waset, adorned with some spectacular artifacts. The face of the mummy was covered in a gold mask and other jewelry decorated the remains. The tomb also contained many lavish grave goods. But the focus of our story is those strange stone boxes sitting in the chambers that led off the main passageway of the Serapeum. The principal corridor and chambers of the Saqqara Serapeum are known as the Greater Vaults, and there's a second passage with alcoves called the Lesser Vaults. Both are hewn from the solid sandstone bedrock, and the Greater Vaults Passage runs well over 1,100 feet, is over 15 feet high and about 10 feet wide. The Greater Vault has a series of chambers that open from the passageway and contain these enormous stone boxes. It was Kame Waset who ordered the building of this lesser vault structure to house these huge stone vessels. He did this while a prince, when his father, Ramses II, still ruled ancient Egypt. Some 600 years later, Pharaoh Samtik I, who ruled from 664 to 610 BC, ordered the construction of the Greater Vaults. These massive stone boxes with removable lids weighed from 60 to 80 tons or more, and each was carved from a single slab of granite. The carving is incredibly precise, with the lids fitting perfectly onto the boxes below. These lids weigh some 30 tons just on their own. Since the large sarcophagi that Marriott found were empty, it wasn't immediately apparent what they could have contained. However, a study of Egyptian religious beliefs and practices at the time when the vaults were built revealed the true purpose of those huge boxes. They were coffins for the ritual interment of deceased bulls. These were not just any old cattle, they were apis bulls. The ancient Egyptians believed that bulls were a reincarnation of the god Ptah and that in depth they took on the identity of a synthesis of the gods Osiris and Apis and became immortal. This combination of Osiris and Apis was known as Serapis, and from that the root comes the word Serapeum. So the Serapeum at Saqqara was a place where not only dead humans but also dead bulls were buried, and those huge stone boxes, which are actually sarcophagi, were the final resting places of mummified bulls. In fact, the cult of Serapis was carried over from the ancient Egyptian dynasties into the Hellenic period, when the Greeks had taken control of Egypt. This period is known as the Ptolemaic Kingdom. Pharaoh Ptolemy I, Soter, ordered that the Egyptians and their Greek conquerors should jointly worship Serapis. His command came in the 3rd century BC, at a time when he was keen to unite the different peoples. Insisting that they both worship the same god was one way of doing this. In fact, another Serapeum was built at the Egyptian port city of Alexandria to reinforce the power of this cult. As these bulls that were buried in the huge stone coffins at Saqqara had to have very particular characteristics. To be worshipped as part of the Serapis cult, they had to be black and white and have a particular pattern on their hides. Writing on our website, Gigal Research, French explorer Antoine Gigal gives a detailed account of the particular characteristics an Apis bull had to have. Gagal wrote, The bull had to be black and white with a white belly. It had to have a white triangle mark on its forehead, an eagle with spread wings on its back, 
a crescent moon on its side, a scarab-shaped mark under its tongue, and a tail with long hairs parted in two. So it was a bull that was predestined for the role. There was only a single sacred bull that was worshipped at any one time. Priests would study the behavior of the sacred bull, which would give them indications of the will of the gods. After the death of an apis bull, it would ceremonially be mummified and taken from its home in the city of Memphis to Saqqara to be entombed in the Serapeum's vaults. The importance of these sacred bulls to the Egyptians is not to be underestimated. When one of them died, there was an obligatory countrywide day of mourning, and then the hunt for a replacement bull with just the right physical attributes would begin. Priests would be dispatched around the entire country in the search for a bull with the correct markings. The ancient Egyptians believed that a true apis bull had to be born from a cow that would be unable to produce any more calves. A bolt of lightning would strike the mother cow and transform its calf into a sacred bull. When the apis bull was discovered, it would be carried along the Nile to Memphis resplendent in a golden shear. Marriott's discovery of the Saqqara Serapeum marked a decisive turn in his fortunes. The Egyptians created a job especially for him, the conservator of Egyptian monuments. From then on, based in Cairo with his family, Marriott enjoyed a highly successful career as a leading Egyptologist until his death in 1881. He made many more significant finds of buildings and artifacts from the ancient era of the pharaohs. But not everyone accepts the description of these giant granite boxes as sarcophagi 